we're just looking at the, the pre-neutronic mechanical workup. It's a large silo, lots of coolant. Uh, inside cylinder is the core. There's lots and lots of Hastelloy in this. The reason there's so much is so we can have decent heat exchange. Uh, this one is sort of a, a nice big desal de plant uh, or a, a, a device to, pow to provide steam so that we can lift the water up and make it useful. We can make uh, irrigation water available from seawater, that sort of thing. This is a large design. The design attributes is we have the prompt scram. Uh, we have the fuel under less pressure than the coolant, and we're just talking a couple of pounds, a couple of PSI. So this way, uh, the bias is towards diluting the fuel, and that, so as the fuel becomes more dilute, the chain reaction will cease automatically and passively in the event of leakage or mechanical failure. This design is relatively simple to, to construct. My theory is, is it's got to have many business applications, so I call this the general process heat reactor. And uh, it's for desal, chem synthesis, distillation, refining, district heat in the Arctic, electric power production, and very hot steam for tar sand production or for heavy oil lifting. So it has many different applications, and market conditions will determine uh, what the ultimate scale is for each of these applications. We have 5,000 liters of fuel in this and an astonishing 200,000 liters plus of coolant. This is to provide a very large thermal reservoir. It's a big thermos, the silo. Uh, the purpose of that is to have plenty of time within which to act. You can build up your heat. It's the money in the bank. The uh, coolant is a clean fluoride mix with no, uh, no actinides in it. And something new here is uh, uh, I decided that moderation on these things is always uh, an interesting challenge. Uh, graphite is sort of the, the, the material that generally is used. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to try neutronic experimentation on movable rods that are solid beryllium clad and hastelloy to uh, provide moderation to this so my fissile loading is, is less and so that I can have control over the spectrum, so that I can go from a thermal spectrum to epithermal to even fast, depending upon the circumstances and the applications that the machine is put to. Uh, our plumbing surfaces are in contact with the salt or hastelloy, and our hastelloy is pickled uh, before it's put into service, and that's passivated. That's like anodized aluminum. It puts a little surface on there uh, that, that hardens up the surface to corrosion uh, and cavitation. Well, the coolant is the cheap uh, coolant. I selected sodium fluoride uh, simply because we don't have to spend money separating uh, lithium. Uh, we use the eutectic. We can add some more volatile fluorides to this mix uh, to reduce the melting temperature. Uh, this may be desirable for some applications. Other applications, no. Uh, and the coolant is pumped through the tank. We have thousands of tubes in the tank. And the, the fuel is essentially uh, sitting, uh, sitting still in the tank, although we can uh, pull out the fission gases uh, as they're produced. And we, we separate out the fission gases and trap the uh, fission products as they, uh, as they are generated. My temperature is around 650 degrees max. It'll go hot, hotter, but I don't want to stress my materials. I want to keep things uh, within the materials book. Here's the core design. Uh, it's, it's lots of tubes. Uh, they're all interconnected. The red is for the, the fluid. The uh, blue is coming towards us. That's the coolant. Uh, the uh, black is the the beryllium rods that are cooled. Uh, also, the rods are standard neutron absorbing materials like boron tetrafluoride we can use to control the reactor. When I do the planning on this at this stage, uh, I'm very interested in my uh, 
ratio, my volumetric ratios. So uh, we look at the ratios between the, uh, the fuel, the coolant, and so forth. I always try to maximize the coolant, have the fuel as one, and using a new moderator here, uh, I, I try to keep my moderator the same uh, as the fuel, vo volume-wise. That way we can examine this thing, neutronically put it through lots of iterations. The green is the solid metallic thorium reflector. So this is where thorium is in the system as the reflector, although we have the option of putting it in the fuel if we want. Here's uh, the design looking at it from the top. The, the, the petals on the daisy there, uh, that's the, the heat exchange coil. Uh, then we have our, our chimney or our tube that uh, is our, our thorium reflector or thorium blanket and then our core. Uh, here's our system view in vertical. We're starting at the top, the export is our, our, our heat. Uh, it's in red there. Uh, the heat exchanger is blue again. And the little detail, you see, you see the core and you see a, a black line just above it. That's the safety rod. That's a large uh, cylinder. And when it's depressed by gravity, let's say there's a, an incident, uh, so we turn off, the, the electricity goes off, gravity settles this machine out, and the first thing that happens is the safety rod goes in and deprives the core uh, of a critical volume. So automatically, uh, in a failure situation, we've already addressed the chain reaction, we've turned it off by moving enough fluid out of the system so that the core is no longer critical. Uh, then as we go down, we see that our standard traditional uh, melt plug below, and then our, our dump tanks. Uh, so it's a gravity-fed system in case of catastrophe. I sort of designed this thing with the idea that the, the black swan was going to fly by tomorrow afternoon, but didn't quite know when, and so we got to be prepared for it. Here's the, the detail on the core, uh, detail of this plunger, the idea of the safety rod coming down and uh, uh, displacing the, the liquid fuel. And you'll see there's a you know, big number of pipes there. Those are the coolant being pumped through this core. This is our size information. With this iteration, this big one, uh, our core is 3.6 meters uh, in diameter and, and four and a half tall. Uh, we have a pretty good fuel volume, so this allows me to run it pretty, pretty lean. I don't need to have a lot of fissile in the fuel to, to make it go. My thermal reservoir is enormous. Uh, it's 25 meters tall if I need it. That's a big silo of heat. It may be outrageously large, but it, it's with the, uh, the, the principle of, of, of 40 to 1. Fuel is 1, 40 is coolant. It provides many passive advantages, many features. Our dump tanks down below uh, can deal at uh, a volume of 1,200 liters. The reason why it's more than twice that of the fuel is because we can pre-pack these uh, dump tanks with uh, coolant in solid form, like gravel, and the hot fuel comes down and melts that gravel and dilutes itself and, and loses heat. So we can deal with the, the hot heat uh, uh, from a core during an emergency situation very quickly. We dilute the fuel. We can also have some cadmium fluoride down there to catch any neutrons that, that might still be in the system. And we can also have some uh, uranium-238 tetrafluoride uh, down there in the dump tanks as well. And those will act to further proliferation, harden the fuel to get the percentage of fissile down way low so that the, there's uh, no threat material or greatly reduced threat material uh, in the system. So, depending upon where in the world it would go, uh, we, we have that option of having additional denaturant down in the dump tank. Uh, we have a very large ratio here uh, to uh, transport heat through uh, for the coolant uh, to, to take away. It's enormous. Uh, I will be trying to reduce that as the neutronics are done. Uh, here are just some pictures again, just the system. Uh, beryllium rods and the peacock below, our, our thorium reflector, again our uh, heat exchanger, and, and 
what's coming out at the top is, is a hot salt loop, and that, that salt goes off and energizes maybe a steam generator or some industrial application, maybe in an ammonia plant, somewhere where heat needs to be inserted into an industrial process, that's where that, that, the hot salt is piped over to that and then brought back. Lots and lots of uh, pipes. There are about uh, 3,700 pipes in this thing, uh, which is a lot. I'm going to try to thin that number down. Uh, and there is the uh, freeze plug. When the power goes off to the, the freeze plug, it's a quick melt and it drops down. So we have an additional measure of safety even if the scram switch doesn't work for some reason or another, soon that uh, hot salt will melt out and down it goes into the dump tank. I've emphasized safety today and flexibility of application. We're relying on gravity to cool this thing off. Uh, if there's a day when we don't have gravity anymore, uh, I guess we won't have to worry too much about anything. Uh, so I have a strong feeling it's going to be there and we, we use the gravity to to run the passive safety de divine, uh, design features. Uh, I've talked about the denaturant. Uh, this is important now for proliferation control. Uh, this provides a, a much higher level of, of proliferation safety, being able to process the fuel in an emergency situation to reduce the, the fissile concentration of the fuel down to minuscule. I mean, we can go from 3% to 1% relatively easily with this type of a setup. Uh, but, but if it's not in a hostile environment, you, can, you have the option to not have the uh, denaturant in the dump tanks, and so you, you won't, you, your fuel will go down, but you won't have to re, uh, rework your fuel, re-enrich your fuel to get it back again. So you have that design option, which is, which is pretty good. Additional passive features, we've got the thermal reservoir, that big silo you saw, is double lined like a big thermos so that uh, we have redundancy. This, uh, the coolant has is, is got two walls before it can get out, but even if it gets out, it'll freeze up relatively quickly. So uh, the, the coolant is, is a much better uh, system uh, because it really doesn't go anywhere if it escapes. Uh, we have the leakage managed by the differential pressures. Uh, we've got a lot of pipes here, so we're going to have leakage. So we have the bias going towards the, the fuel. That way we're diluting, diluting our fuel, and we can detect we're having a problem because the reactivity of the machine is going to go down. And that will give us a clue. Maybe it's time to change out those pipes inside. And then with this large ratio uh, of, of fuel, uh, the coolant to fuel, um, the, uh, if, if there's a major incident, a malicious attack on the structure, uh, and a major failure caused by evil intent, uh, we have uh, the ability, if the, we have a complete failure, a complete breach, all that happens is the fuel mixes with the coolant, and that's that. The neutronics die away, and we're left with uh, a fuel that will freeze up, but it's, it's been cooled or it's been diluted by the coolant, so it's no longer as uh, much of a diff difficult material to handle as it would be if it were hot rods that, that we saw, for example, in Japan. We were looking for talent. Thorenko needs you if you have uh, mechanical uh, skills, engineering skills, and, and can use the computational software. Uh, I'm very interested in looking for you, and I'll be after some of the, the companies that provide the analytic software. I'll be looking for some of those guys. The Neutronics on this one will be done by P&L again under contract. And then the final integration work, uh, I still like Los Alamos, their D division. They, they were quite competent with the uh, computational uh, design for reactors, and I'll be looking forward to putting this, this project in a more final form within, ultimately. My friend Heber Savaria in San Francisco did the mechanical drawings. He's excellent. He's on this point. Ralph Moore got me to be a little more communicative in my slides, so I thank him. And I thank the Alliance for uh, giving me a chance to fill you in about these designs today, these new designs.
Thorium designers, remember we got export controls in the United States. If you're in the business, talk to your lawyers. Give me some questions. All right. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I have a two-part question. One, what is the uh, estimated amount of neutronic flux that your molten salt coolant is going to receive approximately? Do you have any idea? No, presently I don't. What, what, what I'm, I'm looking for, the reason I built this thing so large is to have a very, as light a flux as I can on the Hastelloy. And, and so it, it will be 10 to the 14th or so neutrons per uh, centimeter squared. It'll be two times 10 to the 14th probably in that range because that's what you need to keep the thing rolling. So then the second part of my question would be, because the sodium-23 has a 1.66 bar neutronic cross-section, in other words, it's very much not zero, um, how are you going to handle the changes in pH as well as the production of proton as it goes up to magnesium-24 and then decays back down, you're going to end up with proton in your fluid as well as a pH shift because magnesium is plus two? We'll be looking at the neutronics first and we will see at the rate at which the, the, bi, the, the side reactions occur. And then, because it's a liquid fuel, we can manage the fuel with Lewis bases or Lewis acids as we're going along. So it's something we'll be looking at, but it isn't on the top of the list. The, the, the first thing on the list is, uh, hey, let, let's, let's look at, at the power output, and let's look at the neutronics, let's look at the aging, let's look at the fission products that are generated to see how long uh, this device can stay going uninterrupted. Rusty, turbines and electricity don't turn you on? Well, no, well it's, that's business. It, it just depends what application you, you've got. We've got a, you know, 200 megawatts here, or 300, perfectly good for power production, perfectly good for desalinization. It just depends on who the customer is. You know, if it's, it's a mine out in the middle of nowhere, maybe these guys want a lot of process heat. Uh, electricity is always available as an option, but it isn't the primary business focus of this particular uh, device. Rusty's hot cells. <laughs> Made fresh daily. All right, guys, I'm actually uh, uh, going to ask you to keep uh, talking to Rusty on his own. <laughs>